Tuesday. Yes, it's that time on a Tuesday. We're joined by Daniel Finkelstein. Morning, Danny. Good morning. And David Ivanovich. Morning, David. Do you know, sometimes I wish I had the voice of Alan Rickman, in which I would say to you at this point, you'll feel festive, surely, with Matt Chorley. <laughs> Do you like our jingle? Do you like our jingle sent it by a listener? Gillian it is actually, It is actually rather fun, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I've, got my, I've got my jingle bells as well. So if at any point you want to burst into song. No, I like the jingle. I don't want you to jingle your bloody bells, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Step too far. Right, uh, let's get on with it. David, I want to talk to you about one of your tweets. Uh, the contribution, this is what you tweeted yesterday. The contribution of David Davis MP to 21st century Britain would make an interesting doctoral thesis. So let's let's sketch out what that thesis is. Discuss. David Davis is a really a str- it's, it's a really interesting kind of a, a of a politician and a politician's story uh, and so on. I mean, I think it's fair to say that David Davis is one of these people that no other politician trusts. I think Danny, that's broadly right, isn't it? Because um, they never quite know what his agenda is and what he's up to and why he's doing it. He was very influential or fairly influential around around the around the Brexit thing, then completely disappeared as Brexit kind of hove into view. And we actually got doing the things in Brexit and are rather not doing any of the things that he said we would be able to do. He then turns up in his guise as libertarian, as a kind of a, a, a gadfly around the government at odd kinds of, odd kinds of times. Um, he was, of course, the main contender versus uh, David Cameron for the leadership back in 2005, which he lost. And if you remember, he had women going around with vote double D on their chests, uh, famously. Um, I've always thought there was kind of element of him, which was a bit kind of Leslie Phillips, you know, kind of, well, hello, ding dong, um, et cetera. But that may be entirely uh, unfair. Um, and it, and the way in which he kind of pops up this sort of uh, this maverick opportunism, you might kind of call it, with a hint of principle, it just really fascinates me. And he's been at it again this week. Uh, and I gather you got him on the programme. But yeah, apparently, you... yes, he is. He is coming on later. So we, we can ask him if he thinks he should be the subject of a doctoral thesis. But maybe Danny will tell me that actually I've got it entirely wrong and he's totally um, tedious and uninteresting and I should no, be thinking not. about someone else. No, you have got it right. I don't think the Leslie Phillips thing works at all, but um, I I think that um, he's certainly a loner. So he's like it's interesting when you say he's not trusted by people. He has a lot of allies, but they tend but they do move from issue to issue because he doesn't. He's not very predictable. And I, and actually, I've come to rather um, my, my sort of admiration for him has increased because a lot of times I haven't agreed with him, and I really didn't agree with his leadership thrust i thought his decision to resign um as shadow home secretary was really eccentric but um i've often come to find you know things like double jeopardy uh or um or judicial issues he's often very good and i think you know if he didn't exist you'd kind of have to invent him that there are there are politicians that michael foot did that book loyalists and loners uh, dividing people into into their sort of natural and i'm definitely much more of the former than i am of the latter and if you only had um loners uh, you wouldn't be able to form any sort of government right and, and david davis showed that actually by by not ending up being a home secretary in david cameron's government even though he was slated to be that then by not uh, being able to stay in the job with Theresa May as Education Secretary, despite being sort of quite personally law to her, but he wasn't able to stay there. So he's shown that. But 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 at the same time, if you only had um, loyalists, I think politics would be unbearable. So um, he does. I think you're right. He does actually that it would be the subject of a doctoral thesis. But I but I don't. I, I mean that in a sort of relatively flattering way, actually. Um, even though sometimes I find his positions infuriating as he finds mine. Um, Actually, I think, as I say, if you didn't exist, you'd probably have to invent him. I do remember... It's very good, you... Matt. Can I just say, Matt, that was really good. I mean, honestly, <laughs> that was really, really good. And I hope you kind of take that out and, and, and print it, because um, Danny's completely <laughs> convinced me. I mean, I was kind of, kind of halfway there anyway, but that makes an awful lot of sense, and his division makes an awful lot of sense as well. I feel like we're we're, we're we're writing somebody's column live on live on the radio. I'm not sure who's not mine. <laughs> not mine. <laughs> 
if, if it's still hanging about by the end of the week, I'll take it. Um, uh, I know, D- <laughs> Danny, I've... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I know from from personal experience and exchanges with David Cameron that his relationship with David Davis uh, was not always a good. I mean, he partly because David David Cameron was someone who prided that that sort of loyalty, and I don't think could really understand David Davis going off and doing his own thing. Do you think? That's- yeah. Well, I remember meeting with him on a. We were at a party actually on the day that um, David had done that, David Davis, and I was with somebody that uh, was a friend so we of mine. Just explain. David Davis was Shadow Home Secretary in David Cameron's front, front bench. And uh, he was very cross about ID cards and New Labour's erosion of civil liberties, he saw it. So he quit as an MP to fight a by-election to highlight the issues of civil liberties. And then all the other main parties didn't stand. So it was just David That's Davis right. and some crap. But it was puzzling to David Cameron leader. because he was sort of resigning in pursuit of the policies David Cameron believed in. And I remember I was talking to David Cameron with... A friend of mine that he that David Cameron didn't know and he didn't want to just hold forth about David Davis and what he thought in front of this other person so he just goes it was it's very interesting isn't it Danny and I knew everything I knew exactly what he was trying to uh to say to me but as I say as I said before people um D- David Cameron definitely belongs to the loyalists rather than loners uh and f- sometimes what loners do can appear completely baffling to us um, and that was one of those instances right but uh, if you look across the whole of David Davies's career it makes much more sense uh, than, than treating it as a single data point. The only thing I would say about David Davis and maybe this is true of a lot of politicians is that he is that he bends arguments to suit his case with a fabulous alacrity and we bend reality that, to suit his case. Well, I, knew I, I, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that, Danny. But some people do it more than others, and it actually, I think it, I think it matters a bit, and sometimes it matters more than others. Sure, I, I don't think I felt that his arguments, particularly even when I've disagreed with him, which I certainly did in on Europe, I didn't feel as though he was bending. Um, well, it was, it was all going to be a doggle, and he can. Uh, well, no, and I thought he, he was just assure you that it was all going to be an absolute doggle with Nick. I think he felt that. Felt that. He was completely I wrong. But I, I do, don't do think, think he thought that. Well, in that case, he's stupid. Uh, you know, it, because that was a stupid thing to think. I mean, it was a stupid argument because it obviously wasn't going to be the case. And I don't think he's a stupid man. So I, so you can say he well, he convinced himself of his case as people do, and then kind of embellished it uh, 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 and so on. But I had a terrible feeling that he was prepared to be careless if that suited him. The one thing I quite like about him is that I've written some terrible things about basically taking the mickey when he was Brexit secretary, when he claimed that the impact assessments of Brexit were in incredible detail, but also did not exist. Uh, And uh, he turned up at a meeting and he didn't have any papers because it was all in his head. Uh, All of that I thought was quite funny, but... Maybe it's just because he's a grown-up. He's always taken that in quite good spirits. Sometimes if I've tweeted something he's disagreed with, he's called me up. We've had a perfectly pleasant conversation. He just wants to chew the fat and get, you know, he's not, he's not mad like some of his colleagues are. He's not rancorous with journalists. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely true. And that is, uh, and that makes him a pleasant person to talk to. There's, that's no, there's no doubt of that. Well, we'll ask him later on. He's on uh, a bit later on. We'll ask him um, if he if he wants to be the subject of your doctoral thesis, uh, David, <laughs> uh, which you can you can you can knock out in an afternoon. Um, right, let's uh, let's move on and talk about when is the point that we start taking the polls seriously. When yeah. is the point where, where where Boris Johnson going down? The fact that in most polls now, I think. Keir Starmer's seen marginally as a better choice to be Prime Minister over Boris Johnson, though still behind, don't know. At what point Matt, do can I the poll seriously? Can, can I start this one? Because, uh, and I have a particular reason for doing it. I was working at the BBC in 1992 in the aftermath of the exit poll that went badly wrong in the 1992 election. And after that, as is the BBC style, there was a massive uh, post-mortem. And there was a huge discussion, I mean a huge discussion in the news divisions and so on about how you should report polls. A series of uh, rules were made that you you never report single polls and so on, and also the conditions under which you would take polls and and report polls because of the possibility of uh, error. Now, with social media, one of the things that's happened is there's a whole group of people, lots of people, who will always give you the latest poll result and always treat the latest poll result as if it was somehow of great significance and was going to tell you really what was going to happen and so on. 
And so you make a division in your mind between, if you like, polls which could be right or wrong, but actually won't tell you a very, very big story, and then runs of polls, which actually begin to be something that you can dig into analytically and say, yes, I think, I now think I can see something going on. And what I'm interested in at this point, and uh, I'm interested in yours and Danny's view about this, is whether this run of polls we've got at the moment is a run of polls which we should say, yeah, something is really serious, something fairly serious is going on here and uh, so we don't consign it if you like to the kind of the monthly poll uh, level which could mean practically anything and where any way polls differ um so that's why i kind of you like table table this item for our agenda <laughs> well my my view would be i think that the so far at least what's tended to happen is that although the toys have gone down that hasn't tended to benefit keir starman labor tended to end up ahead by the Tories undertaking them, if you say, rather than a sort of surge of support. And the same is true with That does seem to be changing a bit. That Now when you see the changes, you know, it's Tories down four or five points as Labour up four. So that does seem to be a, a switch. I mean, I suppose the biggest thing, Danny, is that the politics is just incredibly volatile these days. And that, Yeah, that, so, that... look, I'd be looking for a number of things. First of all is uh, longevity, and we just don't know at the moment. Um, we all have an instinct. I do think it something sort of it represents something really important and the reason that i do is because um i think it represents a change in the prime minister's uh poll ratings that may turn out to be a bit longer standing because one of the reasons you can't take individual you know a small run of polls is that sometimes the reason is a switch sometimes the reason is simply that the, the voters for a particular party are much shyer they're saying they're less certain about voting um and therefore they're marked down in the polls so it's it's a feature of the modeling of the polls um rather than of uh, a long-term change in public opinion it's also you know like we're three years from an election quite possibly certainly a couple of years that's an awful long time um so i, I think it's uh, i think um I do think this is significant for because because of the change in the prime minister's ratings, and I think that when you get a when you get a long term political opposition can't win if it's losing on the economy and on the prime minister. And before this, Labour was losing on both, even when it was even in the polls or just a little bit ahead in the polls. And now that's not the case. I think that is quite significant. But you know, if just for an example, it's by no means certain the Conservative Party will face the next general election with the same leader. Um, and um, so therefore you can't take this as telling you that much about the next general election, but it does, it, the question is whether it's anything more than a kind of bouncing round of even current opinion. I'd like a little bit more of the, of, to learn a little bit more, but I think it probably is. That was as far as I would go. How much more, how much more would do it for you? If you had these uh, broadly similar polls to these going on three months, next, probably. let's say three months. Yeah. So if we come back to this essentially in two and a half months' time, yeah. and it's broadly the same, in that case, we can say we think we now yeah, yeah. understand and establish uh, patterns. Uh, but it's a reasonable measure of current opinion, right? So the, the, the important thing about it, the important thing about that, that doesn't, that is, gives you some data that helps you decide longer term public opinion, gives you some data about the next general election, but mainly it just tells you about the current position because we're two years away from uh, from. An, an election um and 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 you think to yourself what is the main variable that's changed um and it is uh, views of best prime minister um if that's if that remains stable i think it probably will tell you something that will be significant if it remains stable over and over and, and finally Dan, sorry to take up your role uh, uh, matt uh, to no, use derp it momentarily but um uh, you know the Conservative Party far better than I do, and much, much better than I ever want to. Um, uh, how much are they looking at these polls and thinking, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm now getting anxious? Um, so my, my, my understanding of it is um, the issue that's causing the Prime Minister the biggest trouble is the, his COVID policy um, and not necessarily this. Uh, that people are still inclined to a view, which I don't actually hold, that there's some magic in Boris Johnson where he understands the electorate um, in a way that and, and has a connection with the electorate that Conservatives can't have without him. 
Um, and, um, you know, I think is that the reasons for him having done reasonably well are quite banal, actually, that, that, that the electorate is more uh, economically left wing than the Conservative Party and more economically right wing than a lot of, it's more socially right wing than a lot of um, Labour MPs. And so both groups find it difficult to understand why Boris Johnson's positioning works. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, they, but there is a view that he has a sort of magic, and I think that still probably remains. Um, and it takes an awful lot before there is a kind of move to, to remove somebody. And it's usually got an ideological element in it. And of that, I think the COVID stuff is the more dangerous to him, even than um, some of these ethics issues. Although, in parenthesis, Matt, I did think, I do think if Christopher Geit uh, were to decide, and he hasn't said that he that he will or that he won't. I'm assuming he won't, therefore, but if the Christopher Guy were to decide to resign, I think that will be a tremendously serious issue for the Prime Minister, one that he may not survive. I've always thought... By the way, I was, I was going to nominate, if you were to ask me, Matt, uh, Lord Guy as my man of the year. Yeah, because I've said this to you, David. I've said this to you, David, privately, yeah, so and, and, the, and I, you know, I don't want to be ethics, coward about ethics it. Ethics watchdog, who no. um, is... He's the second one. Alex Allen resigned because Boris Johnson wouldn't get rid of Priti Patel when she broke the ministerial code for bullying. Uh, they appointed Lord Geit, and now he's the one who's looking into wallpaper. That's the one that he was he was appears to have been lied to about whether or not Boris Johnson knew he was paying for his yeah. wallpaper. So, by the way, just just because I've said this to David privately, and I don't want to be a coward about it, I, my view is that um, that it's unconscionable for a British Prime Minister to have lied to his ethics advisors to the point where he would resign, and that anybody who would support continue supporting that being done right would be complicit in it and i'm not prepared to do that so for me certainly that would be an incredibly serious uh, moment that's why lord guy is my man of the year because he holds danny finkelstein's loyalty <laughs> in his hand <laughs> Finally, Danny could go off and rejoin the SDP. Uh, that would be. No, I'm not. This is this is not. By the way, this is. I've said this to David too, right? This isn't about. This would be about whether Boris Johnson was fit to be prime minister, not whether I'm a conservative or not. Yeah. Um, that, that's not dependent upon his wallpaper bill. <laughs> Very good. Lovely to speak to you as ever, gents. We look forward to uh, somebody writing a column about David Davies this week. Uh, David Wadovich <laughs> and Daniel Finkelstein. You can read them in the Times uh, every week. Just get yourself a subscription. Go to thetimes.co.uk. Uh, and if you sign up, then you get your first month for free. Oh.